Welcome everyone. Perfection Learning is excited to have each of you joining us for tonight's webinar, focusing on where you should be in your AP Lit class now that you've reached the second half of the school year. It is my pleasure to introduce our expert and teacher for this evening, Dr. Brandon Abden. Brandon comes to us with over 20 years of experience in the classroom, including 12 years as a high school English teacher, many years as a professor of English and education, and time as a curricular, curriculum developer and instructional coach. In addition to his time in the classroom, Brandon has more than 10 years of experience as a consultant, and he formerly worked as the lead director for the International Advanced Placement Program at the College Board. Brandon is a collaborator on a number of projects to support English teachers and their classrooms, including the Mosaic Slow Conference Project and the Garden of English, and he'll be telling you a little bit about some of those tonight. Our favorite credential on Brandon's resume is as senior author of Perfection Learning's AP Literature and AP Language Coursebooks by AMSCO. For all the participants, Perfection Learning will send out an email tomorrow with the recording of the webinar. And as you have questions tonight, please be sure to post them in the Q&A section on your Zoom screen. Brandon, thank you so much for being here to share your knowledge, and I'm going to pass the presentation off to you. Thank you very much, Kristen. And uh, if you could go ahead and just give me uh, a thumbs up, Kristen, if you can for sure hear me. I just want to make sure that everything is working just right. All right. Well, welcome everyone, and it is a pleasure uh, to see you and to join you here. Uh, I would like you to go ahead and familiarize yourself with Zoom. If you're not already familiar, I know uh, many of us have become experts in it over the past uh, several years, um, but uh, it's a little bit different because we're doing a webinar, so uh, I encourage you to check that out. And um, there's also a Q&A button at the bottom where you'll be able to um, post some questions later on. Um, and I want to make sure you're familiar with that so that you can interact with this a little bit. Likewise, as we go through this, I'm going to have uh, at least two moments where I ask you to interact with a document. And I'll be sure to drop the link into the chat for you so that you can see that. Um, and it will ask you to use Jamboard, which is a free tool from Google. It Google account if you're a school Google er, but uh, I, I really haven't had any issues with that. It's only happened once or twice. So I, I want to welcome you again to what um, I decided to call um, AP Lit at the middle of the year, a conversation on anxieties and controllables. And um, just just imagine it's December, you're tired. Um, you're fairly certain that you cannot lead another discussion about or design another activity around something like the juxtaposition of short sentences and longer sentences in the same text and the effect that variants would have on the text. I know it's January now, uh, and you may feel a little bit more energized coming back from that holiday break, but you needed it. In short, you needed that break, you know, winter break, holiday break, end of semester break, whatever you call it. Well, it's, like I said, it's January now, and you're ready to push through to the end, about four months, about 16 weeks, or about 80 days until your exam. So this was always a time of year for me when I was a full-time classroom teacher, and still is a time of year for me as I work real closely with teachers here in Cincinnati on a day-to-day -day basis, or I work with other teachers consulting uh, around the country. There's always a time of year of excitement, especially if you're teaching literature and liter literature to seniors. It can be equally as exciting and frustrating, um, especially with the conditions of the past couple of years. I know, Andrea, it, it feels a little bit more stressed when you come back, you're ready to go and you're like, oh, I've got a lot to cover. So we're going to spend some time talking about the realities of this and not just this course, but also the context and the environment that we're in. And some things that I suggest will help you feel a little less stressed. But first, I really want to talk about what's going on here. So chalk it up in the, the realm of uh, things you don't need to tell us with a headline. And 
in October, this article was published on a, a survey site that um, tracks educational trends. And I will copy the link address and drop it into the chat so that everyone can see it if you're interested in linking to it. But what I'd really like you to do is look closely at this summary. I'll give you just a moment to read through that. So again, tell me what I don't know, right? And I understand that. However, I really want us to focus on that last bullet and how positive that bullet is. Not does it, it could be, but for me it is. That despite these feelings, you all, as are you're represented by this data, and I know that not all data can represent everyone, I get it, but you all, teachers, as they're represented by this data, are still committed to education. You want to stay in it, but the current conditions are just untenable. Well, a, a little over a month later, the same website gave us a similar article. It's almost a study in cause and effect in a way, right? And I want to show you this brief summary of it. And I want to remind you, it's January. This was just about two months ago. But here's what I want to point out. Again, that last bullet. I could have asked 6,000 teachers the same kinds of questions before the pandemic, and I guarantee you, I would bet money on it. Of course, I bet money on it because there's no way we can test it because we can't go back, but I would bet money on the fact that the things listed in this third bullet are the same things about which teachers would concern themselves because these are the things, myself having been a teacher, an administrator, working in districts, you know, I work with 22 different buildings here in Cincinnati. And, and these are the things that if I could do all of them, I would, because these are the things that would make things easier for teachers across the board. So the horrors of COVID, everything that it has done to what we thought of as normal, the way it's affected our students, still the things that concern us most are these things. And these things should concern us. I also want you to note from looking at this that you are not alone. Most of your colleagues, as you see, feel the same way. And we're, we're, we work so hard that so many of us were the types of students in high school or college or both. I was not in high school, but I was in college, who are used to, to working hard and achieving. And, and we're working hard. We just don't feel like we're achieving, but you're not alone. And I'm telling you right now, I'm sitting here to talk about it. But I'm also telling you that I'm not going to sit here and say, it's okay to not be okay. It is okay to not be okay. But it's almost cliche to say that. All right. But talk to your colleagues, share ideas, go to them, tell them, hey, I'm stressed. I don't know what to do. I need some help. Reach out to me. I'll give you my email. I'm going to give you my uh, Twitter handle, and I'm going to give you my Instagram handle. Reach out to me. I have conversations like this all the time. Okay, but we're going to spend some time digging into some things that you all um, have told me in my conversations with teachers uh, on social media, as well as face-to-face. -face. We're going to dig into some of those things in a little bit. And of course, shameless plug, we'll talk about how the textbook, the literature textbook hits at those. A lot of these things will transition to language too. All right. Let's talk about this for a second. I've got a real problem with self-care and I'm not going to pontificate on it, but I want to touch on it just for a moment. 
because yes, you should be taking care of yourself. But that's really easy for me to say. It's really easy for anybody else to look at you and say, oh, take care of yourself. You know, do this for yourself. Well, you can't do that for yourself in many cases, or it's very difficult to do that for yourself. So I do want you to take time. We're going to talk today about how you maybe can relieve a little bit of that stress. Okay, but I also think about this, and I want to be very careful with this. Uh, when those in charge tell stressed out people to remember their own self-care, it can be just another way of feigning concern and reinforcing that there's work to be done. I'm not saying always, I said it can be. But I, I want you to think about this for a second. And I invite you to react to this. I'm going to be silent for about 30 seconds. I invite you to react to this in the chat. This is your chance to kind of react to people who may have said this to you or really encouraged you, or maybe you found a way to make it work. Um, you know, I, I've tried to focus on that myself. So I'll be quiet for just a few seconds. Yeah, thank you, Kate. You're absolutely right. It's very hard to say no. And the younger you are as a teacher, the less experience you have as a teacher, the harder it is to say no, because you feel like you have to say yes to things. I get it. It is like a joke, Andrea, sadly. You're right. I'll, let, I'll wait for maybe two or three more people to post something in the chat as they think about this. And of course, I invite you to disagree with me. That's fine, too. Benjamin hit the nail on the head. Self-care solutions do not help the bigger issues of burnout. So while one or two of you finish up, one or two of you, one or two more of you, sorry, finish up your chat here. I'm going to expand on what Ben said because that was going to, that's where I started. And that's when I wrap this post before this slide before we move on. Yeah, you can say, go take care of yourself. But when you have 10 to 12 hours every day, you don't have time for that. And that also goes back to what Andrea is saying when you've got more, or what Kate's saying about saying, so, you know, I, I can't say no. I was asked to be the National Honor Society. And I teach all those kids, so I may as well just do it. It's going to be easy. It's going to be easy, but that's time that you won't get back. And it matters. And yes, Heather, always, it depends on the relationship. Yes, yeah, I did a workshop on rhetorical situation earlier today, and that's exactly right. It depends on the person who's saying. So, um, great. And yes, Jennifer, I see that about not letting the kids down, and we're going to come back around to that too. All right. You may recognize this meme from 90s Saturday Night Live. This is the late, great Phil Hartman playing a character called Stuart Smalley. And it's sad in my life that I've reached a point that I have to explain who this is because, you know, just, just a few years ago, I didn't have to, but that's okay. You might have heard it before, though, this self-affirmation idea of I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me right? It's just not enough, though. You can't just keep telling yourself that something has to give. And it's going to take looking at ourselves, too, because we and what we do in our classroom and what we ask our students to do, that is what we can control. But like Jennifer says, you don't want to let the kids down. It's hard to do that gut check and say, maybe I don't have to do that assignment. Maybe I don't have to read Hamlet because it takes six weeks. And I know that's blasphemy. I'll get emails about that. But that was hard for me too. And that's kind of framing our conversation here a little bit. So what really matters? This webinar is going to center around things that really matter for you and your students. Understandings that are absolutely essential. Things students must do regularly or daily. Things you may have already taught but should teach again, and even things that you think you have to get to but don't, really. So right now, I'm going to drop a link in the chat. 
and it is to this jam board. And if you've been to my sessions before, you know how much I like jam board. And I'm going to ask each of you to go to that link. And I want you to think about your classroom. What are two or three things that really matter as far as the AP literature course, the teaching of the course? Let's transition into thinking about the course and content. If you want to look at my screen right quick, you can go over to the far left hand side. You grab a sticky note right here, move that sticky note over. All right. And so the thing I'm going to add is conflict because I know my students have to understand conflict really well. I'm going to add complexity. And then I'm going to add thesis and reasoning. Okay, you may want to repeat mine. That's fine. Go ahead and add yours here, two or three. And you can shrink the size of your post-its too, if you want to. If you know you've hit, you put something on there and you can't find it, it might be hidden behind someone else's. That happens sometimes. Feel free to grab them and move them around once you post them on there. If you all need uh, the Jamboard posted again, give me just a second, I'll post it. There we go, I just put it back up there. Now, while we're doing this, um, Pete, I see that my friend Donna Carpenter is on and she's raising her hand and I would love to hear from Donna. So if we can unmute Donna, that would be fantastic. Hello, Brandon. Hi, Donna. It's good to hear you and, and well, not see you, but good to hear you. Yeah, I'm on my treadmill. I'm multitasking. Good a for little, you. That's a little bit of self-care, right? Right. Yeah. Um, I was having trouble navigating um, through the Jamboard, which I do use, but I was going to add um, effective feedback on their writing. I think they need a lot of that right now at this point in the year. Absolutely. And it's something we're going to come back to when we talk about ways you can do things like that and, and save some time. So I'm, I'm really glad you spoke up, Donna. Thank you so much. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you for doing this. Oh, absolutely. I love it. You know, I do. All right. If at any point you, uh, you, you want to add to the conversation, I'm going to give about another 30 seconds or so here for you all to add to the um, Jamboard. Uh, if you'd like to add to the conversation, please feel free to raise your hand using your reactions button at the bottom of the screen. You may have to click more and click raise hand. You'll pop right up to the top of the screen and we can unmute you. Donna's on the treadmill with her a little bit of self-care, taking care of herself. Uh, I'm going to go have a beer after this. That'll be my little bit of self-care uh, and I'll do the treadmill in the morning. So we all have our thing, right? Okay. So I want to just pause here for a moment. And if you've gotten all yours on here, great. Um, I'd like you to go ahead and look at what all of your colleagues have put. And if you've not gotten all yours on here, you've got another couple of seconds to a minute maybe to get them on here while everybody looks around. All right. So a couple of things that I want to talk about as I look at this list. First, I feel that you all have a really good grasp on the things that really matter the most. Now, some of these things are really, really large. For instance, I look at stylistic components of a text down here in the bottom left-hand corner. That's a lot. So I would encourage you, not just that individual, but all of us to think about the things that fit within that and what makes for stylistic components. And really look at the course and exam description, thinking about that. 
um, because trying to teach stylistics itself is huge. I mean, I took a whole course in college on that later in, later in college, but you might want to focus on a couple of things like sentence structure. Okay, so, so how can you take those big things and shrink them down? Okay, you might have heard uh, of, of, of a book called Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott, and I'll talk about Anne Lamott again here in a little bit, but um, very important book to me as a teacher and as a person, and she, uh, her book is, you know, one day her, her brother was asking her dad, hey dad, how do I write this book report? He said, just take it, it's, I'm sorry, this report on birds, and he said, take it bird by bird, write one, do another one. It's analogous to how do you eat an elephant, one bite at a time. Okay, so break these big things down. So when I see up here, for instance, someone who wrote, um, or was it, they've moved it and that's fine. I'm glad they moved it, but I need to find it now. Well, it was something about, somebody had written something about writing coherently. Okay, that itself is a very big task too. So think about breaking it down again and say, well, what is it that is the least coherent about these? Do they have a thesis? Do they have claims that relate to the thesis throughout the paper? Things like that. And we'll talk a little bit more detail about these things here in a moment, um, but, but anywhere where we can break it down. So when I see tone, for instance, tone can be really large, but if I look in the course and exam description, tone's always related to perspective. So how can I really dig into perspective so that students see how tone relates to perspective? Because perspective is a little bit easier to grasp, and then I can get to tone. All right, oh, and here it is, ensuring students can write coherently. Excellent. So we're going to come back to this uh, Jamboard in just a moment. Uh, I'm going to come back to my PowerPoint now, if you can come back to the screen where I'm sharing. Um, and, and I appreciate you offering that. So I, I want to tell you all, that in the survey I did, kind of informal survey, and over the past several months, I've been talking to lots of people, um, AP teachers, again, in my district and across the country. And these are the things kind of in, in buckets that they gave me that, that seemed to worry them the most here at the beginning, at, sorry, at the middle of the year. So I'll give you just a moment to, to read through these. I'm not going to read them all out loud to you. Okay, as you wrap it up, you've probably already noticed, and I have it in two separate columns, um, you know, lettered you know, separately. So you may be already plucking out the heart of my mystery, but I want to see here. I do, uh, and very intentionally, two different categories. Anybody want to take a chance and drop in the chat what you think these two categories are? Oh, Benjamin, I like that COVID and regular deficit. I like that. I hadn't thought of it like that, but I can see where that would work. Yeah, that's not what I was thinking, but I, I think I could see where that could work here. Okay, good. Anyone else want to take a shot? And I understand that some of you are on the treadmill. Some of you are walking dogs. I got a, 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 a personal message that you were out with the dogs and couldn't type. Uh, some of you are, are cooking dinner. I understand that. And, and you, if you can't participate, that's totally fine. So, oh, Andrea. Andrea nails it. Okay, so uh, Andrea, I'm going to ask my colleague Pete to, to unmute you. And I would like you to talk me through what told you this, what gave it away. All right, can you hear me? We can hear you really well, thank you. Okay, <laughs> um, well, when I'm looking at the first column, I mean, those are things you can't control students' motivations and what they're doing, and you can't control the fact that COVID happened. It happened, and I struggle with constantly trying to get them to read. Um, there's only so much we can do. But with the other things, we can keep giving them samples. We can help them figure out how to grow. Um, we can increase their confidence in our feedback and what they do. And you know, obviously we can give them more and more time to practice. Um, e is more of a 
you know, our concern. <laughs> yeah, we have control of it, but that we can't stop thinking that way. So that's normal. <laughs> that's and right. um, yeah, and same thing with F. I mean, you know, we it's our job to make them know that we care about them and what matters, you know, how they're doing in the world. Right, right. And um, so, Andrea, really nice work. I need to ask you, Andrea, how long have you been teaching? This is my 21st year. Wow. Well, thank um, you. Teaching. Thank <laughs> you for Thank you for sharing that. I uh, wasn't trying to out anybody, but thank you. No, it's um, all right. You know, um, but uh, I appreciate that and, and really excellent analysis of what's here. And um, if you, uh, you can go ahead and mute yourself again. Thank you. Okay. Um, but yeah, Andrea just nails it. And, and I want everyone, whether you've been teaching 20 years, whether you've been teaching two, whether you've been teaching 30 years to really look at this and you can disagree with me. That's fine. Um, but these are really your un con Controllables. I want that to sink in. You can't make them do it. Okay. It's not your fault that COVID happened. Learning loss is not your fault. And I even worry about learning loss and how, how it's becoming, uh, it, it's kind of reversing some mindset thinking. It, it, it becomes deficit thinking in a way, and I worry about it. That's a different discussion, though. Okay. You can't force them to read. You, some of us think we can. Some of us think, oh, I'm going to give them a quiz every day. They're not either. Some of them might be reading because of that. Others are not. And, and that's not engendering a love of, of, of reading. I say, well, why are they taking AP literature? Hey, that's a great question. There are ways around that. I, I thought seriously about putting reading over here because there are ways to structure your classroom and your expectations that allow and encourage them to do more reading. But I decided to put it over here with uncontrollables because you can't make the kids do things. And if you're using grades to make the kids do things, you're using grades for punishment. That's not cool. That's a different discussion too. I'll get emails about that one. That's fine. Okay. We wish we could control student health and well-being, and it is hard for me to say when I work with teachers, but I have to tell them, and I'm going to tell you all and beg you, let your administrators and others worry about the kids who aren't there. You have to focus on the kids who are. Okay, now, uh, it's great to see, uh, if this is the Kim Pierce I know, uh, then it's wonderful to see Kim Pierce dropping her idea and her comment in the chat, and I'd love Kim, to hear from you, uh, if Pete doesn't mind unmuting you, please. Yes, Brandon, it is your Kim Pierce that you know so well. It is. Great to hear your voice, Kim. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and my comment first was about your book. It is absolutely, um, it's been a game changer. Wow. And as I put in there, Ben is one of my, my, my peeps on my team, my AP Lit team. And so we are, it, it has been a game changer. It has helped us refocus how to work through so many of the skills and how to keep rebuilding and kind of, you know, to, to spiral, to spiral those skills as we go through. So my comment about your book is that if, no, if, if people haven't gotten it yet, do what you can, use your AP money at your campuses, do what you can um, to get copies. Uh, in your teacher's hands and in your kids' hands. Um, but the other, my question simply was, yeah, uh, the list of all the uncontrollables, it's just kind of like that old, the old saying, you know, let me control what I can and let me let go of what I can't. And, and moving forward with that. But at the same time, this is such a, a unique year, such an anomaly. And this is my 40th year teaching. Wow. And yeah, just but I cover it really well. Um, but we're, but working with, this is, I, I've never, you know, none of us have ever had a year like this. And then working with kids that have such that, you know, they came to us as seniors, but they were still like sophomores. They didn't really have, have what we have been expecting for the, for the last several years. And so just kind of wondering how, how to approach that, still have them ready by May, but still the bigger, the bigger picture of, making them critical thinkers, making them critical writers and being able to, to read and discern. Those are still those top skills we've got to be able to do. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and I want to be really clear. Um, uh, I didn't ask him to be here and we didn't pay her to endorse the book oh, or anything. No. Um, and uh, but, uh, you know, Kim, I'm glad. And that means a, I mean, that means a lot coming from you. I really appreciate it. I'm going to drop you an email uh, later on. Um, but um, and, and uh, Benjamin, if you get to work with with Kim, then, then that's great. You're learning a lot, no doubt. Um, but um, I, I want to address the way you say it here in your question is great. Because learning loss versus gaps. And kids, most kids had foundations. Not all kids. Most kids had foundations of things. And what we now have to do is what you say, bridging the gaps of those skills. But I also want to encourage people. And, and this is a, a something we did uh, in my district on Monday, a workshop with this. Um, encourage people to spend time figuring out where your kids are because they might be a lot further along than you think, especially when it comes to uh, reading and writing. They're out of the practice. They haven't, they, they've lost the stamina, maybe. They've lost the ability to sit for long amounts of time and do it because they've been so stimulated with media and other things, because those are things we have to train ourselves to do. Okay, but... It's more of a gap than a loss, I think, in many situations. Um, there's lots of really interesting research coming out about those things. So, Kim, I'm glad you asked that. And, and you talk about the book. I mean, we are going to be talking about the book here. The way the book does those sorts of things is at the end of every text, at the beginning of every unit, there's a main text for that unit. At the end of that text are questions related to what's going to be learned in the unit. And those questions are about challenging yourself, taking a chance saying, here, go ahead and try to answer this. And I did it with uh, Shepherd, uh, Shepherd um, Independent Schools, Shepherd Independent School District in Texas today um, with one of our texts. And the kids were outstanding. And they had, uh, they've had some teacher turnover and other things, but the kids were doing a really good job. And the teacher told me um, that they were surprised at how well the kids were doing you know, with all the, the turnover teachers and things like that, that they've had. So often kids will surprise you. So thank you for asking for uh, about that, Kim. So I see another couple of pop-ups here. Um, yep. Okay, great. I'm going to have to move on for sake of time here, uh, but I really want to think about these controllables and that's what we're going to spend our time on here with some of these. Okay. So I'm going to spend some time walking through each of these slides We'll get some time to react at the end, but I really encourage you to drop stuff in the chat uh, like Jerry Brown just did. Um, again, that's probably the inimitable Jerry Brown, and I'm just honored to have you here, Jerry. Um, you know, teaching over 50 years and still working as a homeschool teacher. And I really appreciate that, Jerry. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, Jerry, you contributed to that as a, as a reviewer on the book, so thank you. Um, so I really encourage interaction with students' essays. Not your interaction, their interaction. Even before they turn it in or as practice, they write a paragraph, they write a thesis, and then you're having them highlight where they use the same words or the same phrases. Let me grab my little pointer here. They're using where they use the same words or same phrases or same ideas throughout each paragraph. They're highlighting and drawing circles and connecting. They see that line of reasoning that connects things. And if they can't connect those things, then they probably don't have a clear line of reason. The next step then is to ask their peers to do it. That is a little bit more, uh, that's a, to me, a more valuable peer review than having a peer go through and correct all the grammar or mark punctuation or ask just simply ask questions peer review takes a lot of time and you may be doing a great peer review in your classroom that and I'm, this isn't to say that what you're doing isn't valuable but this tracking of ideas throughout a paper and throughout paragraphs could be very valuable for students to learn how to convert their thinking into a paper Another thing I'm really a fan of, and the book does this a lot. Hey, there's a picture of the book down there. Uh, the book does this a lot is organizers and templates for planning. Now, I hear teachers all the time say, and they're saying it for the right reason. And y'all, I'm a national writing project person. 
I went through the National Writing Project years ago. I've been on the board of the National Writing Project. I'm all about students writing and learning to write and writing a lot, writing organically in some ways. But if we're going to teach most students how to organize their thinking and how to quickly think about things that they've never thought about before, like a poem they had 10 minutes to read or five minutes to read, they need graphic organizers. They need templates. And just like any scaffold, literal scaffold, as you build things, the scaffold comes down slowly. So I know so many teachers say, yeah, but it, it takes away the student agency and the student voice. I completely understand that. And there are ways to re release them back into that. But I've seen so many students who, if it weren't for those organizers, they would have had nothing to say because they had so much and they don't know where to start. It's hard. It's not as hard for us or you because something in your experience has made you want to be an English major. And so you may be a little bit easier at that. Sorry, maybe a little bit easier, maybe a little bit better at that. It comes easier to you. All right. Uh, in the book, we have organizers at the end of every unit. And they build on one another, both the language, chat, the language book and the literature book, they build on one another. So that when you write a practice organizer in one unit, you're going to come back to that in later units and see how it grows. Because you learn to write the paragraph and then you're going to take that same paragraph two units later and you're going to write an essay. So it's coming back to those things and learning as you go. Very much the idea of teaching writing, not assigning writing. There's a big difference there. And I'm a super huge fan. And here comes Anna Lamott again. Again, I should recommend that book, Bird by Bird. Check it out. Short assignments, short writings. Paragraph, maybe less. But if they're doing that daily writing, maybe they're writing paragraphs. Okay. They're sharing it with the class and talking through it. They handwrite it. They type a draft. They talk through it. They share it. You decide to share it up with the class. Maybe it's right after a seminar or right after a discussion you guys have had, and you, ha you wrap it up by having them do five or 10 minutes of writing. That's how they start to think about converting that thinking onto paper, because I had a great comment from a teacher who said, my kids have these wonderful discussions, but then they go to write and they can't. Nothing from the discussion makes it into the writing. Well, don't let the discussion end with the writing. Have them do the writing and then come back and discuss what they have written. Or, and my favorite thing, and the two classes I taught today, I did it in both classes. Have them write first have a discussion that way they have something to say they've had time to think about it and i know everyone has something to say not just the five or six kids who always speak and then after you've had some discussion have them go back to what they've written add to it revise it change it and then share it that's a very simple pedagogy and what you're going to have to let go maybe is some of that seminar time, that Socratic seminar or Harkness table time that you're so interested in, okay? My, my students have great discussions about texts, and I rarely, rarely, rarely do a full class seminar. All right. So I understand this next one completely. My students are stuck at a certain score of growth. Well, I want everybody to be really realistic about this. And this is why I'm glad that people like Kim and Jerry are here because I know they're going to nod their heads. Be like, yep, yep, it's absolutely true. Listen, y'all, getting a three on an essay is enough. A three out of six. Okay. That's pretty darn good. All right. I know you want them to get up to that four. All right, but look here, this first bullet, the five exam, the top score on an exam 
average is a five on the essay rubric, not a six. So if kids are getting the thesis point and they're getting a two in row, a, row B, they're doing okay. Not great. They're doing okay. Moving from the two to a three on the essay is a big deal. And I need to revise this. I'm sorry. I'm going to do it right now in front of you because I made a mistake and I want to admit it. Moving from a two to a three in row B on the essay is a big deal. Okay. That is a gulf between rows, between point two and point three in row B. And that have a feeling if I were talking to you, most of your teaching this year with writing with most of your students has happened right around that point, that point two in row B. And all this, com this stuff about commentary, this stuff about evidence, stuff about students explaining themselves, I have a feeling that's where it's happened. So target there, target there. If you're trying to spend your time teaching to row C, the sophistication point, you're probably wasting a lot of your time. It's hard to say that. And I know we all have those kids who say, man, if I just work with them, the, well, great, work with them, him, her, they, work with that kid or those two or three kids individually. And really target the writing at that in row B, that two or three. Because you all know if they don't have a thesis, they're done. So, but you've been teaching thesis since the beginning of the year. Okay. If you're struggling with that point two or three and you're struggling with commentary, it's okay. So is everybody else. Keep at it. Keep working. Okay. Yes, Don, I like it. Their pot of gold is in row B. Absolutely. And Donna, we know a little bit about reading essays, don't we? I think Donna and I were at the same table uh, in my last year reading lit. Um, so um, now what everyone needs to realize, 55% or more on the multiple choice is pretty good. I got an email from a teacher just the other day who was very upset, said my, you know, my kids are getting, um, you know, at the beginning of the year, my kids were getting this and now you know, my lowest is a 55%. My highest is a 75% on the multiple choice. And I can't get them. I can't get them any higher. And I emailed her back. I said, when did you, when did you, she goes, oh, in November, they got that. And, and then when, at the end of the semester, they got the same thing. I'm like, well, they're doing great. That's fantastic. So one thing I really encourage teachers, allow and incentivize corrections when they do this practice multiple choice and use the multiple choice to teach. You, it, you don't have an example of a question that is more targeted to a very specific skill and piece of knowledge in the course, the AP course than multiple choice. And so, oh, there's a picture of the book again. At the, if you don't have the textbook at the end of every section, not every unit y'all, every section, every small section, we have one, two, or three multiple choice questions that specifically target that skill in that unit for teaching, not assessing. And then at the end of the unit, we have practice passages and all of the questions from that unit, sorry, all of the questions there tied to that unit. And then there are questions from other units, because we do have questions from other units that tie to other units, we tell you, hey, this is from unit five. So, you know, oh, I haven't taught that yet. I'm not going to hold kids accountable, but I'm going to try it. I think they could do it. They lack confidence. I get it. COVID probably figures into that a lot for some kids. No doubt. Okay. This is, I, I, I hesitated to put this on here because this is so much a pedagogy thing, but the number one thing, I decided to put it on here because I, I need to reiterate to everyone and telling English teachers this is almost absurd because I know you all know this. The number one factor for teacher value add and all the studies for decades now, and even John Hattie's big study where he went through all these things. If you're not familiar with Hattie, H-A-T-T-I-E, his work um, reviewing all of the 
the things that people have done in classrooms and he's looking at what really matters, what really has an effect. The number one thing is the relationships. Do kids know that you care? Do kids see you working? Okay. And it's about, and, and the confidence is all about that, those relationships. And it's hard. I know when kids are sick, when their parents are sick, when, you know, there's lots of political strife and other things, I get it. Okay. But I, I just give you some hints here and this isn't English. This is just good teaching. I think. Now, the discussions and the writing and the sharing of writing that you're doing can and probably should include all of these things. You're having that discussion. You have them do that writing at the beginning of class. You're like, yeah, you, you know, Kristen, I really like what you said. I heard what you were saying when you were talking to Jerry. Would, would you share that with the whole class? And that gives you that opportunity to really lift that kid up. Or, or ask him to repeat it or feed it back to him. Say, Donna, I really like that. I want, I'm going to say it again because I want to make sure I understand it. Okay. And little things like that matter. Think about the best professors you had, the professors that made you love English and the way that they would navigate those sorts of things. And they probably did similar stuff. Okay. The last bullet here is so important. Share their writing, any of it. You've got that kid who never speaks in class. He's not that great of a writer. She's not that great of a writer. Let's not gender cast them. You know, they're not that great of a writer. And you know they're struggling. They're probably not going to pass the exam. But you've got that one sentence in that passage that is so good. And you say, hey, I really want to share this. Everybody. I thought this was so interesting, this angle, this direction. And that kid will remember that. That kid will email you or talk to you about that in 10 years because that's the first time an English teacher has said something to them about their writing being good or their an idea being good. Now, I know this all feels frou-frou for some people. You know, yeah, yeah, I get it. I, How do I get my kids to pass the exam? Right. Th this confidence is going to be a big part of it. Okay. Be really careful, y'all. I've seen, I want to be, lots of incentivizing things. Be, be careful with parties and rewards. You know, people saying, oh, if you do this, I'll bring, don't, you know, it, it, I've seen it backfire uh, because teenagers can smell condescension and disingenuity. Okay. You know it. Right. I think you're going to get much more of a bang for your buck from these daily things than you will those sorts of celebrations. I could be wrong. Okay. Oh, there's a book again popping up. P people concerned they've not done enough time to practice. You're not going to like this. These are the kids. Time, everything. Everything. They got to get used to it. You're going to do that writing at the beginning of class before your discussion. They got five minutes. You're going to do the discussion. You're going to set a timer for 20 minutes. It's for you and for them. They've got that paragraph to write. It's second week of August. They're going to write up. They're going to fill out a paragraph organizer. They've got 30 minutes to do it. What happens if they don't finish? Figure it out. You let them finish it. You, you, you navigate it. Maybe there's no way your kids are, your kids are too fragile. They're too far behind in August when they come to you because you don't have a good vertical team. You don't, they're not coming from AP language. You don't have that as a junior or you're teaching AP literature to sophomores and they didn't, you know, they're sophomores. And so you don't, yeah, you, you judge it, but whenever you can get time in there and squeeze them, do it. It sucks. I know, but they'll get used to it. And you will feel a lot more organized, I promise, as hard as it is. I know this isn't why a lot of us went into English. We wanted to have beautiful discussions about text with kids. I get it. The exam is a reality. You're teaching this course. You knew what this is. Maybe you didn't sign up for it. Maybe you were told by a principal, hey, this is what you're going to do. Okay. You work for somebody and that's the expectation. The reason I have the book on here is because the activities that we have in the book, I don't, I thought about suggesting times and things like that, but I don't, but they're perfect to where you could, you could easily look at them and see about how long they would take kids to do all the different activities for the different sections. Yeah, Susan, I see that they're, they're, Susan, I love what Susan says there that they're, they're salty at, at her from all the squeezing. Yeah, I know. They'll thank you later. They will. 
So people say, I'm not sure if I'll get to what matters. Well, I flip that on people and I say, just make sure you know what matters. And so here's an activity I do with my AP summer institutes. Um, I have them walk through the AP course and exam description and pull out the terms in every unit. Okay, if you want to take a picture of this real fast, do it. I'm going to change it in just a second. But I pull out the terms in every unit and we, we look at it and we see what's here and what's not here things. We do this at the beginning, but then about halfway or two thirds of the way through the week, I pull it back out. I said, okay, now that we've spent time looking at the exam, looking at the multiple choice, talking about how the class can run, let's think about what really matters. And we go and we target everything. So you'll see here what they've done is in the middle, this is one of my groups that did it this summer, in the middle are the things that they must do, the absolutes, got to get to that. These things like, I cannot teach the course and not cover these things. The white circle is the may do's. Okay, like, yeah, the, I probably should get to these things too, but they're not the most important. And then the outside circle are the things that mm, it'd be nice to get to those. I might cover them a little bit, but I'm not going to spend a whole ton of time, whole, whole lot of time on them. This is huge. And a lot of these things in the middle are things that you see repeating throughout the different units. But what's hard for us? Yes, we did, Andrea. We did this in the evening course. That's right. Okay, uh, the AP Summer Institute that I taught this summer. What's hard for a lot of people is things that, that make us geek out. Metaphor, illusion, symbolism, you know, hyperbole. I, I don't know that I've taught a whole lot of it. I just like saying it, you know, alliteration, you know, it, it might work its way outside. And those things still matter. But you, you see other things like conflict character, tone, external, internal character changes may matter a little bit more. And so you may have to look and say, you know, I'm going to have to let that whole poetry project and the whole four week poetry project. I'm just, I'm not going to be able to do that. I, it just, it's just not, I'm not getting enough bang for my buck with that. I'm going to have to adjust. I'm not going to be able to spend six weeks on Hamlet. That was a hard swallow for me because we did so much with Hamlet and the kids got into it. I don't mean just the four or five kids who were really into anything. The whole class was really into it. I was able to motivate kids with it, but I had to let it go. And I started doing Merchant of Venice instead, and the kids liked it just as much. And it took me not even half the time. And it's so undertaught. Not now, because I'm telling you guys to teach it, but. Um, the reason I have the book on here again is the way the book is organized is you see all these terms and these ideas pop up regularly throughout the parts, throughout the units. And every time these terms pop up in the book, they're bold-faced. Not all of these, you know, you might have a couple terms on here because I create this with a group. So, and then finally, do they know they care about you? Well, probably, you know, it's hard though. And again, this is, this is really more about pedagogy and relationships. But, but talk with them, ask about them, share their ideas. These are all things that come back to the confidence building too. But the last three are really important. And this is stuff I'd give to any teacher, not just an English teacher. Be honest with them. Don't accept excuses and challenge them. When I say don't accept excuses. You don't have to be, you don't gotta be a jerk about it. Okay. And remember as teachers, we are risk takers and mistake makers. You're going to try it. It's going to work or it's not. If it's not going to work, you're going to revise it and try it again later. So I was going to have um, you all go to the jam board again and touch on, you know, what you're doing in your AP class that, you know, you may not have to be doing really do some hard reflection on something you might give up, but we don't have time for the jam board. As I begin to wrap up for the evening, I don't want to keep you any later, but I, I really encourage you to think hard about this. And I would love to hear what you decide. If you want to contact me, brandon.abden at gmail.
gmail.com or you can tweet at me. I'll show you my tweet. My tw tw I always want to say Twitter handle, Twitter handle in just a moment. Uh, I'm learning. I really want to know what's the hard decision that you're going to have to make about something to give up. Okay. So that you, because you've got all these things that are coming at you from different parts of the school and that stuff, you can't control that. You can control what you do, and what you're asking your students to do. So again, shameless plug, check out the books. Um, I'm really happy with them. I got to work with some great people and perfection has been fantastic in what they let us do. Um, and you can't beat the price on these. You, you can't beat the price, trust me. Um, and then um, I'll encourage you all, I'm gonna drop this in the chat. Um, if you're interested, you all know that I do some work with Tim Friedis. Uh, a lot of you may, Tim Friedis of uh, Garden of English. Um, uh, we're running some workshops this summer uh, again, and we're going to have some special, oh, didn't mean to click on it. We're going to have some special guests. I'm really excited about this. Um, National Book Award winner uh, and Pulitzer finalist, I think uh, Colin McCann is going to be visiting, and uh, Sarah Zerwin from Pointless, a uh, great book that I've recommended to uh, lots of English teachers, is also going to be visiting our workshops. Um, and uh, I encourage you to check them out. Um, if you mention perfection, when you sign up, uh, you get a discount. So um, check on that and, and please share it around. Um, we don't really have a cap for how many can attend. Uh, we're we're going to work it. Uh, if you can't do July, we're going to do August, some evening courses from five to eight. And that's really for people who find out they're teaching AP at the beginning of the year. Like I found out yesterday I'm teaching AP and it starts in two days. So um, that's why we're doing them in the evening. All right. So uh, here's my contact information. Thank you so much. Please be in touch. Uh, my email's not on here, but it's brandon.abden at gmail. Take care of yourself. Stay warm, stay safe, and uh, take care of your people. I just wanted to jump in and thank Brandon for his time and his insights this evening. Um, Perfection Learning, and I know all of the participants, participants tonight appreciate your guidance. As a reminder to all the participants, Perfection Learning will be sending out an email tomorrow that will have the full recording of tonight's webinar. Um, also, in addition to everything Brandon shared with you, um, if you want to learn more from him, please take the time to subscribe to the Next Step blog from Perfection Learning. You can find that at nextstep.perfectionlearning.com. There you will find recordings of Brandon's past webinars, blog posts, and lesson plans that he's done for us as well. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you, Brandon, and have a great finish to your week. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you, Kristen, and uh, you'll be in touch.